All right, so let's talk about this image. Now, if you notice here, you see just right of center, there's a line going all the way down. So when um, you have a, you're with a 3D printer and you got stuff stuck to the print bed, especially that first strip where they uh, you know, do a, a, a single line they print and it's really on there, don't. <laughs> you use your you use your thumbnail to kind of dig that up and it slid right under and bottomed out at the base of the nail bed it wasn't done it was going to go all the way up my arm because i was going with force so what's funny so so this happens and dr wall and blade dr wall and blade are both in the room and i don't react i don't say anything because i'm a crazy person so I walk over to us, you guys have to see this. Uh, <laughs> Filament's still in there. Oh my God. So I walk up and right in front of him, I'm, I'm a, a, you know, less than a foot from Dr. Wall's face. Super slow-mo, just slide an inch of filament out of my finger. So good. I mean, you could see it here. Can we zoom in? Look at that, it's down there. <laughs> it stopped only because of whatever is the nail bed under the cuticle. Whatever that is, that's what stopped it with force. I know. Anything worth doing is worth doing right. Seriously. Oh, look, you can see where I pulled the filament out right there. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to lecture for story. <laughs> As there's just a bloody thumb from posted in. By the way, this is your homework. <laughs> If that doesn't get people to listen to the lecture, I don't know what does. Replicate this in a 3D environment. <laughs> yeah, it was so good. So yeah, don't you should use those little spatula things. Not your nail. Especially and if you're gonna use your nail, don't go with the grain. You're gonna go against the grain. <laughs> Knock it from the side. That way you only have a 1.75 millimeters that possibly can get under the nail, not an like inch. When you're questioning, is this blade sharp? You don't run your thumb along it. Mm -hmm. No, you run it across. Yeah, yeah. So, right, it was, um, yeah, it was good. All right, uh, what was homework for today? Update environment, right? Yes. Okay, so um, we had already written, uh, I think we had already written, right? A update. Oh, we started writing update ENV. So this is the piece that we have to write. So the job of update ENV is to go through and remember our our goal here is not to add something, not to cheat and say extend ENV with a new name and just rely on the fact that we're going to get a more local scope. Instead, we want to process through our environment looking for a um, uh, a variable um, and. To, you know, well, looking for a variable and its uh, a corresponding value. Now, what do our environments look like? Is it extend DNV, variable name value, extend DNV, variable name value? Is that what it is? Or is it lists of very names with it's lists? It's a symbol and a value. Symbol and a value and an extend. A list. Followed by an environment. Value. Okay. A list. Yeah. So it's a, an environment is a symbol value followed by an environment. Yeah. Okay. So that means we need to process through that type of thing. So we're back to one of our old patterns, our old friends, right? So we know we're done when we hit, um, when the environment is the empty environment, correct? Mm -hmm. Now we can ask if it's null, but I think we actually have an empty E and V predicate here. So we can say cons empty E and V, E and V. If that's true, what are we going to boil down to? Our environment? So that's what we're building on top of? Go ahead. Um, since we're assuming that we're only ever going to call it when the thing is in there, um, why would you need to check if it's empty and not just base out when you find it? Uh, you're right. We could do that. Um, as soon as you find it, you could just uh, cons on the, uh, well, you would ap append to what's left. So you could do that. Um, let's keep cooking from here, at least as a starting point, and we can adjust it because this is kind of a remembrance of one of our old patterns. But you're right. 
Once you find the variable that you want to replace the value for, no need to process more. In fact, you probably don't want to process more because you might update a, a, another scope of that variable, right? So with that in mind, this is probably, this isn't incorrect. It's just something you don't anticipate us ever getting to. Yeah, so we should leave this in case for whatever reason we get into an environment where we never find our swap, right? This keeps it from failing. Even though I did say for the homework, you can assume that the value you're looking for will be there. Makes sense? Um, okay, before we get too far into this, uh, Appel, ask your question so we can talk about that real quick. Yeah, so I was just kind of confused on separating language implementation from language design. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically, uh, you know, I kind of mentioned this in terms of implementing arithmetic. Mm -hmm. How I'd spoken with you, and you were like, "Yeah, well, in scheme, addition is just a lambda," and so then I'm like, "Well, does that mean addition is just an application of the design of the language, or is it part of the fundamental design of the language?" Okay, so at this, so the correct answer is your second piece. It's okay. part of the fundamental design of the language. Um, maybe the better word to put on it is part of the primitives. Right. Okay, so when we think about a, a you know a modern high level language like Java or something like that that you know most of us are familiar with, replace Java with C sharp or or whatever you know whatever C like language you've grown up with. Uh, I know the I think the Ann Arbor people do quite a bit with Java as well, and we do quite a bit with Java. But you see C sharp and um, software engineering. I don't know to what extent, but um, we're going to start doing C plus plus and three hundred starting next semester. Um, and I'll probably put uh, C sharp in somewhere just to make sure, because I like bouncing between languages. That way you don't get into that mode of, oh, I like Java, but I don't like whatever. Because languages are languages, it doesn't matter. Okay, in June, uh, Blaine here is gonna be knee deep in COBOL uh, in their training thing. Now, that doesn't mean it'll get put on a COBOL team, but at Acuity, you either doing COBOL stuff or you're doing Java stuff. Or they also have a web stack um, they work with as well. But I mean, what they do at Acuity, which is something that I'm really impressed with. I think I mentioned it before. I think all employers should do this. Um, and they mentioned it at the Tech Talk, is they train you. They bring you in. They expect you to, A, have the ability to learn and have computer science competence. They don't necessarily expect you to know the Acuity way. They're going to teach you the Acuity way. They just expect you to be a vessel that they can put that into. Right, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, so I, you know, so the fact is, he's going to be using a language, COBOL, that is actually still a widely, widely, actually maybe now more than ever, um, a sought-after language. Super, super, super old uh, uh, programming language. My wife's a COBOL programmer, um, but the problem is, is that the uh, so many of the um, big businesses related to money have so many things implemented in COBOL, insurance companies, banks, things like that. Um, I'll be, I have coffee with the West Bend folks uh, next week, but I've already asked them, how do you want me to do the introduction? My guess is they might have COBOL systems there as, uh, as well. So uh, um, I'm gonna introduce Eric to the West Bend Mutual folks for uh, that internship. Um, you know, so the, the, the punchline is, is this is really old language and the people who are experts at it are retiring or dying off. I mean, it's, it's just the nature of the beast, right? I mean, that was like the original business programming language. It just worked. Why change it? Yeah. yeah I was going to say, Thrive has constantly open positions for uh -huh. mainframe developers and COBOL developers. So if you want to earn top dollar, <laughs> learn, COBOL. learn COBOL. But the thing is, is I've taught you already, programming is programming, right? COBOL has its own little stupid nuances. It's a kind of a line number thing and putting things in, almost an indention type of approach similar to Python to a certain extent. Um, but it's a programming language. You can define variables. And from what you, said, you can ask no questions. Resurgence. You can repeat, uh, what, what, what did you say? And from what you said, no recursion. No, it has recursion. COBOL has recursion. Oh, am I thinking of Fortran? Fortran doesn't have recursion. Um, although I think it's probably unlikely you would really use COBOL to do recursive stuff. I mean, the, the reality is it's a language built for doing business processing. 
So you're very often reading or writing stuff from a database, doing something with that, displaying it on the screen, running, you know, kind of displaying reports, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, my wife for uh, 20 years has been writing COBOL for student records at Western Illinois University. You know what we use Banner for? For 20 years, they've had their own development to group there because they're maintaining these old COBOL programs. Now, just now, have they finally decided that they're going to move towards a solution? They're not using Banner, but like a Banner-like solution. Now, they're going to give up some of their customizability, right? But why do you think they're making that decision? Well, A, it's in the middle of a cornfield, so they do have a competence uh, problem. It's hard to find developers in general, right? Because, you know, you, most of the people there are placebound uh, in Macomb, Illinois. Um, it doesn't mean you can't find good talent, but you're not pulling from a Milwaukee or a Chicago pool. That's not uh, what, you're, what you're dealing with. But on top of that, even the folks that are good are retiring. In fact, for this transition, they're bringing some of the people that have recently retired back in on consulting contracts to make sure that they duplicate the systems in a reasonable way. So they basically decided it's finally worth spending the money now because we're already not able to replace positions as people retire. Yeah. Not to get us too far off topic, but have you guys considered like implementing teaching for like PowerShell? I use it weekly, and it's a programming well, language. It's a little different than other programs. Yeah, my understanding is that uh, uh, Josh uses that in 350. Okay. I think he does PowerShell in 350. He hasn't yet. Okay. Um, historically, he has. So I bet you you do at some point. Um, but yeah, I mean, good suggestion. Yeah. Uh, even if it's not just in that class, uh, somewhere. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. It's extremely useful and it's not, not something you're going to use every day, but it's a different type of programming. Than well, right. PowerShell would be, PowerShell is to Windows as like Bash scripting is to Linux. Right, right, right. It's their version of scripting, OS scripting. Oh. You know, and there's, it's, in fact, we probably would say, I, it's probably not actually fair to say it's more popular than like Bash or uh, C-shell um, scripting, mostly just because of time. Unix has just been around for so long, and the server people, you know, Windows is not the most popular server software. It's very, very competitive, but I think Unix is probably a 60-40 split, something like that, 65-35 split. Um, but obviously in the desktop world, Windows is king, right? You know, only Apple now has gotten maybe. Oh, 2020 is the year of the Linux desktop. Um, <laughs> I, I'm an advocate of that. Oh, yeah. uh, in fact, in fact, we might be moving. We had this conversation just a couple of days ago. We might be moving towards having all of uh, when they come in as a freshman, doing all of our classes as computer science students using Linux as your base desktop. On a Raspberry Pi. Could be on a Raspberry Pi, um, or uh, that's what we require for your, um, you know, for your desktop operating system. Even if you virtualize it or something like that. Now, you see me do stuff like from the command line and things like that, and I use Linux for years and years and years, so that stuff is second nature to me. But it's been frustrating recently where students are trying to install Python and they can't get the Python executable in their path because they don't know what a path variable is. They don't know what environment variables are. And it's not because they're stupid, it's because this has passed modern computing by. Everything's automated now. Now, you might ask the question, why doesn't Python default to put it in your path? You actually have to hit a little checkbox. That's not auto-hit. Make my life a whole lot easier if it was auto-hit. Um, <laughs> you know, but regardless, I mean, I think there would be a lot of value for technology majors to use a kind of a technology-centric OS like a Linux, and that way, that way they then appreciate kind of the quality of life things that Mac OS and Windows give you. You know, no rational person can make the argument that Linux is the better dis, uh, desktop for grandpa. It's just not, you know. Um, but Linux is very powerful and lets you do a lot of stuff from the command line that's really been lost in the world of graphic user interfaces and double clicks. 
Um, so I think it's valuable for uh, technology folks to have that skill set, and I think we might be moving towards that, maybe even in the context of the uh, Raspberry Pi, doing uh, fourth gen Raspberry Pis in like the 175 class uh, or the 200 class, whatever. Uh, those are quad cores now, and that's your Linux. And my understanding is now you can plug, there's a um, software, you can bootloader you can put on there where you just plug it into like a Mac or a PC and it just brings open a window and you just run your OS within a, a machine on there. Has anybody done that on a Raspberry Pi? I'm not yeah, I'm pretty sure that so you can walk up to any computer and effectively launch your computer science desktop just over USB or something. So we'll have to beta test that and see how well it works. But I think that would have great value for technology majors to differentiate themselves from grandpa, right? Um, yeah, so kind of full circle. And I mean, all these things are, are, are actually more related to each other than, than um, I think a lot of people realize. But you, know, you were asking kind of uh, a foundational question about programming languages. Now, if you go back to like a Java, we talk about the primitive types. So, you know, byte, short, int, long, float, double, you know, all these things. These are presumed to be a baseline of tools. When you have a programming language, you presume, okay, I'm going to have the ability to remember something. I'm going to have the ability to ask a question. I'm going to have the ability to, re to repeat some stuff. But I'm also going to have some baseline stuff there, some you know simple tools in my toolbox that I can start solving problems in terms of. Because if I don't have those, I'm really limited on how what kind of problems I can solve. We just added math to our language, and our language was a interestingly enough, you know, interesting enough uh, programming language up to this point, but not necessarily a useful language. Now that we have math, we can do some mathy things, and it's become significantly more useful even just adding one little feature. So I think to your point, there are things that become part of the primitive foundation of a language. And then when it comes to, and, and that's part of language implementation. Language design now comes down to the, um, the thought process that goes into what do I call my loops? Do I mimic C or do I take my own little eclectic approach? How do, you know, the division operator, how does that function? Is it going to give me a floating point or do I have a do integer division by default? Those are just design decisions that go into your language that kind of are, are living at another level. So does that, does that help answer the question? There's a gray line somewhere in the middle. There is gray area. Yeah. I, I guess when I said design, I was thinking more of the grammar mm -hmm. language. Yeah, so I mean, I think I, I basically said the same thing. It's... Yeah. You get to choose what your language looks like, but under the hood, you're still representing programming constructs. Now, can we implement a programming power tool that does some sort of magical loop through 30 things uh, type thing? Maybe there's like a go-to move that the, the particular domain you're creating your language for just does all the time. And maybe it's not really a common um, thing in most programming languages, but if you're writing, uh, if you're creating a programming language for driving, you know, a, a dishwasher, let's say, and just 50% of your code is going to involve this, like, this thing, right? You might as well build it in the language because that effectively has become a primitive in that domain, right? Even though, you know, somebody who's uh, creating text-based Pac-Man probably would never use it. Yeah. So, like, how... So we, we can like define our grammars and stuff and say this is what an int is or yep. this is what this type is. But we're using Scheme to make those. So how if you're like making a programming language from scratch, how do you actually define what an integer is? Because right now we're just saying this is what Scheme says, you know, this is or and we're using that. Do you okay. Understand? Well, yeah, so so we, we happen to be using Scheme, but we could just as easily be using Java here or right. something like that. So we're choosing Scheme because it keeps us off balance, makes us focus on what we're doing and, and working with a new tool rather than working with something that maybe we're more comfortable in. Um, now, having said that, the question you're really asking is the difference between writing an interpreted language versus writing a compiled language. Um, I think, let me go down the path a little bit. Okay. So, you know, an interpreted language, we can always rely on the underlying constructs of whatever language we're writing our interpreter in. Yeah. 
in a compiled language, now that's that's a harder question of like, where do I start? Where's the foundation? Well, you write the compiler in terms of the assembly language, in terms of the architecture that your language is going to write on, is going to be on. So if you're doing this in a, um, Intel-based architecture, what primitives do you have available to you? You have the ability of the uh, low-level language of the Intel processor. You know how to add stuff. You know how to subtract stuff. You know how to multiply stuff. Um, division is actually done as a, a version of multiplication. Um, actually, so is addition. Uh, well, multiplication is de defined in terms of addition. So, um, you know, it, you, those are the primitives that you have av available to you. At some point, somebody had to design stuff on a circuit right on, on, a, on a chip that says this is what a computer is solve your problems in terms of this so that on top of that what you do is you decide um, you know you write a compiler on top of that so now a compiler is probably written in a high level language maybe it's C or something like that and what does a compiler do a compiler translates from a high level language to a low level language so your compiler is starting off with a baseline of I know how to translate stuff for Intel architecture now your compiler also now needs to know about your made up language. What does your syntax look like? What does your grammar look like? So your C program, your C compiler that you, well, your compiler you wrote in the C programming language would read in a text file with, you know, the made up Lippmann language. Um, and it would read stuff in and that's where your grammar would be implemented. That's where your effect would be kind of like what our interpreter would look like. It's saying, oh, is this a lambda expression? If it's a lambda expression, what do I do? Well, before it can do anything, it has to translate it into a language where we have a tool that knows how to do that. And that tool is our processor. So we have to turn Lippmann language into assembly language that is compatible with the Intel architecture. So that, you know, an if statement might look like one thing here at the high level language, but an if statement at the low level language is far scarier. You know, it's not ridiculous, but it it's a lot of moving things from memory into registers and starting off baselines and then doing jump instructions where we branch from one place to an, uh, another label. If a certain condition is true, we're having to solve those problems in terms of what that processor is capable of doing. Just like here, we're solving all of our problems in terms of what Scheme is capable of doing. Does that make some sense? That definitely answers the question for the most part, I think. So compiled languages are significantly more difficult to create, right. which is why you see far more interpreted languages come out um, as the newfangled kid on the, the, the block as opposed to compiled languages. Right. Where historically, compiled languages were where things were, but now we're kind of at this point where we have our C-based languages, maybe our go-to compiled languages today are Java, C-sharp, and C++. Just say that, C++ is still around for several reasons but let's call it the common i'm going to go out and get a job in the business world today java and c sharp all day long you're either a dot net you're in a dot net shop or you're in a java shop um, if you're dealing with compiled languages now you step away from that now all of a sudden we have somewhat special purpose interpreted languages like a python python would still be considered a general purpose programming language you can write any program in python that you can do in in c but it does have some nuances, some packages that are pretty common. And if we're doing like data science stuff, some of the things that are like go-to moves for Python. Same thing like a language like, well, a language like PHP. I think PHP is actually an excellent example. PHP is a full, it's an interpreted, general purpose programming language. You could solve, you could write an interpreter in PHP. People wouldn't do that, more than likely, but you could. PHP has a whole bunch of things built into it that are really, really, really focused on the common stuff you do for web. Why? Because PHP was designed to solve the web problem. And that's what that language was built for. So you want to connect to a MySQL database with PHP? It's one line of code. Magic built in. Why? Because I'm going to be talking to a relational database with my PHP code a lot. 
So I don't want to have this newfangled 20-page thing of all the weird ODBC hooks and things like that to just talk to this database. It's like, this is the IP address on my database. It's my SQL. Go. <laughs> Now you're reading and writing from the database because you do that in, in a web application. PHP was designed with that in mind. So it has those conveniences built into it, the quality of life features. So that's when, if you're going to write a web application, even today, even though PHP is a pretty old uh, tool, you might say, oh, well, I'm going to write a web application. Let's do this in PHP. It's good at that. Right? That's what it does. The biggest downside of PHP is getting your environment set up so you have something that runs a PHP interpreter, a web server that knows how to pre-process for PHP. That's a little bit of an IT task. It's a very interesting task, but that's the biggest problem. Right? That's one of the reasons why Python and Node.js have become fairly popular because Node.js comes with its own server. Ruby on Rails comes with its own server. Um, Python comes with its own server. If you use the, the package, they actually, you can choose from like 10 different servers. Um, but whatever, that just gives you your own local environment in two or three lines of code. Ninja. Um, two or three lines of code and then you're off to the races. But I might still argue that PHP is the better language for doing strictly web stuff. If you're gonna start writing endpoints for like a RESTful API, that's when something like a Python or a Ruby on Rails, things like that, well, certainly Python uh, or Node.js definitely starts making more sense for creating your own API that your program might talk to because that's what Express, the Express server on Node.js is built for that. In fact, I think the command is like, you know, create endpoint. It's, like, <laughs> it's built into it. Go ahead. I'm not trying to Everything we're talking about here is language stuff. Yeah. I mean, this isn't off topic. It's yeah. just not necessarily what we started talking about. Right. So it's fine. So Go it's going back to like that assembly concept. So, you know, the compiler and the assembly. Uh, yeah, but like from assembly down to how we actually get the processor doing what we <laughs> want it to do. Like, I know this is getting really in depth now, but like, so it's not just like the assembly is driving the physical electrical like gates and stuff. Like, how does that? Well, the CPU itself has all those magic tricks in it. Right. So the CPU itself is going to have the ability to move something from memory into a hardware register, which is like a, a variable made of hardware on the CPU. And by the way, the fact that we're asking this question is exactly why computer organization and architecture should not have been removed to our, from our curriculum. And it's exactly why it's being put back into the curriculum. Okay? Because understanding how those things work is integral. At the low level, yeah. I don't know how and, it's, and, it, and it's not even difficult. It's just, it, it just is. It's, a, it's an integral part of, of what we do. So some smart people at Intel, they created this hardware chip. And at first it was, I'm sure it was a scary thing of wires soldered together and breadboards and all this stuff. And then finally we said, okay, this is good. Now we need to make it small. <laughs> okay, and <laughs> that's what, what they did. But, you know, inside of that chip is going to be a whole bunch of effectively programs written in hardware using logic gates, ands, and ors, and zors, and blah, 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 and, you know, all sorts of things that ultimately translate into, if you have two electrical signals going here, one's on and one's off, and it's an or, an electrical single comes out of the other side, right? So you can think of a CPU as a collection of computer programs made of hardware, where you feed it inputs, and an output comes out the other end, and that means something. And you have enough outputs if you want to get a number stored in memory, a the four-bit number. Let's say you want to store a, um, you know, the number two, zero, zero, one, zero. Okay. You need to have an output probably from something that's going to have no electricity, no electricity, some electricity, no electricity. And that's going to go into a memory cell, which is its own program made out of hardware that knows how to hold that as long as it still has power. You know, it just maintains that uh, thing. It's like you're kind of one of those, like a force field thing. Um, you know, when it's holding it there, and then as soon as something reads from it, you know, so you have a guy down here where we're dealing with how does memory work. You know, you have a guy saying, I want to read from that memory cell. And then you have this flag over there that says, you're allowed to read from that memory cell. And when electricity goes here, the value can be read, read out of here. That's how those things are work. Those are the primitives of computation, yep. of computers. So our processor has all these little tiny 
things that it knows how to do. And not an individual one of those things isn't overly impressive. It's like, oh, I can read a single zero or a one. Hmm, that's useful. Or I can read a nibble, four zeros and ones, or I can read a byte, eight zeros and ones. Cool, but what am I gonna do with that? That seems to be a pretty far cry from Battlefield, right? You know, write your, you know, pick your favorite video game or operating system. We're, we're, there's, a ga there's a gap here, right? So how do I turn my C code that maybe makes sense to me and ultimately get it down to all those little gates, all those little things? Well, that's where assembler code comes in. The assembler code lets us talk about, you know, performing, um, you know, bitwise shifts, bitwise ands, bitwise ors, uh, uh, tests whether something is zero. Almost all of our Booleans in a, um, uh, an assembler language deals with doing some math and then testing to see if the result is zero. And if it is, jumping to the place where your true expression is. If it's not zero, jump to where your false stuff would be. You know, that's how that decision is ultimately made in hardware. And that's how our assembly language, which has the one-to-one -one relationship with every one of those magic tricks in the CPU, it provides a more English-like, um, you know, approach to it. But assembly language is cryptic in and of itself because when you're, when you're writing one line of assembly code, it's not doing much. You know, you're sitting here saying, well, I'm going to move whatever is in memory address 1000 into register AX. Done. What am I going to do with that value? Well, I want to add it to the number three. Before I can do that, I have to add to register BX a three. So I'm going to do an add immediate onto a zero. So I pull from the zero register. So most of our architectures make the assumption that you have something built into the processor that always gives you a zero. Because if I want to get a three loaded into something, I can always add a three to a zero when I get a three. That's how you say int i equals three. You say bx, you know, I'm going to say add i, bx, that's my destination where I want my resolution to go from zero register, whatever it's named in that assembly language, three. Add i says add immediate. That allows you to add a, a numeric literal. So I'm going to add three to zero, store the result in bx. Now I have a three in there. Wow. I just did a lot of stuff and all I've done is I got something that was in memory, now in really fast memory, and I got a three. I haven't done anything with those values yet. I just moved them. Okay, I'm four or five lines of code in, and all I've done is I've loaded two variables. Okay, now I want to add them. So I'm going to say CX, well, I'm going to say add, CX comma AX BX. Add whatever is in AX to BX, storing the result in CX. What am I going to do with that value? What if I want to do IO? Well, now you got to do the you got to do IO the way that architecture does IO. So if I want something to ultimately get displayed to the screen, a lot of times the architectures are written in terms of an operating system. That's what the operating system is doing. It has an API that knows how to talk to the magic tricks of the CPU. So ultimately, that CPU, when you write your code, you're ultimately running on the CPU, and then those things on the CPU ultimately are turning into system calls on the operating system, which ultimately turn into reality. Things dancing around on your, sc on your screen, right? So we're, we're relying on those smart people in Intel to create all those little magic tricks and then saying, here is your list of crazy simple things that you have to put together in a really long, interesting way to solve any little problem. That's your Lego kit. Now go build stuff with this Lego kit. And you look at it and say, those are small Legos. <laughs> I like the big bridge Lego where if I want a bridge, you just bridge. <laughs> I got a bridge. But no, they, most of them don't give you that. They give you half plank on bridge. You can build bridges out of planks and you only have half planks. So now you're gonna need 50 planks, 50 half planks to build a small bridge. Well, 
Well, in the end, you got a bridge. But you had to use a whole lot of little tiny things to accomplish it. And you're solving all your problems. And this is true in any sort of problem solving. Take it away from computer science. You solve all of your problems in terms of the tools you have available to you. Okay, you want to build a house and you've got dirt sticks in your hands, well, you find a way. You start drying dirt bricks and you start <laughs> digging them up and piling them on top of each other and eventually you've got a house. Right? It's not an impressive house, but look, I do that with my bare hands literally. That is God's dirt, God's sticks, and God's made hands. And I made a house. <laughs> That's the tools I had available to me. That's what human beings do when we solve problems. Make sense? So all a computer's doing is the saying, here's your Legos. What are you going to say, Apel? You had a, your hand up at some point? Oh, yeah. Um, or did I just naturally answer it with the awesomeness? <laughs> well, I was just going to ask that historically, um, output was done by writing to a special yeah. form of memory, right? Yeah, even modernly. It's not historically, yeah. You basically, that, that architecture says, you know, look, if you happen to put a value in this one place, I will notice. <laughs> and when you do that, that triggers me to go into a new mode, beast mode. <laughs> and beast mode, well, it was probably IO mode, but beast mode sounded way better, right? Okay. And what beast mode does is it's going to go and do some IO. It's going to halt the processor, interrupt the processor, go do some IO stuff. And then it's going to come back and it's going to say, look, got the stuff. I'm going to put it right here for you. You can find it in register DX. Don't tell anybody. Just look there. You'll get what you asked me to get you. <laughs> so basically IO is done as a drug deal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you hide the cash under a mailbox. <laughs> CPU finds the cash, goes and does something, brings it back, hides it under the rock by the, uh, uh, <laughs> the elementary school. <laughs> you go and get your value, get your stuff, get the stuff. <laughs> There's anything in here. That's I.O. It's a, <laughs> that, that, that's I.O. I.O. at the architecture level. And that's ultimately what it is. It's solving problems in terms of those Legos. And it's no different than what you've been doing since you were two or one. You know, you were solving the problem of trying to hold your head up with these weak muscles in your neck. That's what you had available to you, right? You know, plus you had the nice, uh, you know, mom or dad putting a you know, holder back there. So why do you even need to build those muscles up? Somebody else is going to hold my head for me. You look back and think about some of the laziness we've done. Like, why should I hold my own head? I got a perfectly good person here holding my head for me. <laughs> it's beneath me to do that myself. <laughs> I'm not going to do that myself. So now when you think about computers and you think about programming, you think about problem solving and you keep abstracting it to the point of just how human beings naturally problem solve, you realize that computer science isn't all that hard. We're expert Lego builders. We just have a really kind of intimidating Lego set put in front of us, right? You go out there and you buy the, you know, it's the, like the giant puzzle. You know, when you're a kid, you get the, you know, the, the four piece puzzle. <laughs> like these only go together one way <laughs> and they all look the same. <laughs> so you just put them together, ah, I built the puzzle. The kid's all excited. But then you got those puzzle experts. Don't you hate those people? They're worse than wine snobs. Like, look, this is a four million piece puzzle. Yeah. yeah. Each piece is two and a half microns wide. <laughs> <laughs> they're there with they're there with one of these things, and they're they're you know they're actually using like like tweezers and stuff to like get the pieces together, and that's a hard puzzle to put together, but it is possible to put it together. Right? So what's the level of granularity to, that we want to puzzle um, that allows us to solve the problem we're trying to solve while it's still being in the wheelhouse of what a human being can process? Seems like the around, what is it, like the thousand piece puzzles, those seem to be, a, they're like the normal folk can solve those. And then you have the, it's like, well, that's beneath me, so I'm going to have my puzzle custom made. 
as an aside, aren't like jigsaw puzzles kind of not even puzzles? You're like just finding and matching stuff, not really having to do any critical. Don't tell the puzzle people that. <laughs> yeah, you tell the puzzle people that. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, I mean, that's those are fighting words. <laughs> yeah, like you're, we're we're right back to I/O stuff on the CPU at this point. <laughs> They're going to start finding body parts under the mailbox. <laughs> Those puzzle people don't want to say, look, you're basically, this is just the hide and seek. <laughs> All right. So, covered a lot of good stuff, I think, today. Um, so, hopefully, that actually closes some gaps on how language stuff works. All right. So, um, I won't give you an assignment for uh, um, Friday, but you will have an assignment over the weekend. We'll come back on Friday. We'll finish doing what we uh, did here. Um, this was valuable uh, today, so I don't want to discount that. Um, but rather than me give you something new from here, the next thing we will be doing, if you want to start thinking about it, is we're now able to update our environment, let's say. Um, we're going to start thinking about how is recursion implemented and kind of thinking about if you wanted, to, if I wanted to just give you a little kind of nugget to start thinking about, it would be how do I put a, the current state of a, of a lambda, current state of a function on hold to come back and finish it later? Okay, we have to think about main, you know, restoring the current state of something that's mid-execution because I can't actually continue on until I get the answer from something else. Make sense? So that's kind of what we're working towards. Yeah. All right, questions, comments, concerns, bribes? Uh, I got a bill. Huh? Got a dollar bill? You gotta put it under the mailbox. <laughs> I got a shiny quarter. <laughs> All right, I'll see everybody on Friday.